what is with all these cookie pop-ups and why do we need to accept them? In this class, we'll take a technical look at cookies and try to understand what they really are and why the internet as we know it today cannot work without cookies. And yes, I'll show you a way to get rid of all these messages without impacting your privacy. Sounds exciting? Then let's get started. To understand where we are today, we need to get back in time. It is the early 90s, and while the internet was still young, early adopters noticed a need. A need to make the internet more personal. You see, if John and Mary would open a browser and visit the same website, they will get back the exact same content. There was no personalization. What if John had difficulties reading the text and preferred a larger font size? Or Mary wanted to see the Spanish version of the website? There was no way for the website to know this and store this preference. The internet was impersonal. You see, HTTP, the protocol that powers the internet, is stateless. Think about statelessness as if you are dealing with a person that constantly forgets what you just said. Without using some kind of memory in our communication, using the internet as we do today would be almost impossible. When you type in an address in your browser and hit enter, what happens is that the browser will send an HTTP message requesting that website. The server receives your request and sends back a response with the page requested. Essentially, the server has no way of knowing who you are and which request you have sent before. Every request is processed independently of other requests. Your request is not much different from the other millions of requests the server has to handle. This made things like adding a product to a shopping cart very hard to do. Around 1994, two smart guys working at Netscape created the initial specification for cookies. As a side note, at that time, browsers like Google Chrome, Internet Explorer or Firefox did not even exist and Netscape was one of the major browsers out there. Since there was no reliable way of uniquely identifying somebody, the idea was to use the user's computer to store some data. For example, if a website wanted to distinguish between new visitors and returning ones, all they had to do is set a cookie. The agreement between the browsers and the websites was this. When I, the website, send you a cookie, you store it in your cookie jar. When you send me a request later, make sure you send me all cookies you have held for me. It is as simple as that, and this is still valid today. It is worth mentioning that if, for example, Facebook sets a cookie on your computer, other websites like Google or Twitter won't be able to read it. As a security feature, each website can only read the cookies it has set. But why are cookies called cookies in the first place? The concept of a cookie was already known as magic cookie or fortune cookie and already used in Unix systems as a form of identification. As you know, a fortune cookie carries a message with it. The identification process using magic cookies is similar to when you are handing out your code at a cloakroom and receive back a ticket with a number. That number has no meaning for you, but without it, you won't be able to retrieve your code. But now let's get back to browser cookies. To better understand how cookies work in a browser, here is a quick example. If I'm visiting this website for the first time, I'm getting this version. However, if I refresh the page, the text on the website changes. So how is this possible? Let's look behind the scenes to understand what is going on. I will open the developer tools and click on the network tab. This will allow me to see the HTTP requests being made. When I requested a page for the first time, the server has sent a cookie. A cookie is technically speaking part of the HTTP messages being exchanged. The response contains the information requested 
but also some headers which hold additional data. One of these headers is a set cookie header. When the browser sees this special header, it will store the information on your computer. Cookies are represented as key value pairs. The key is essentially a label used to identify the cookie, as a website can set multiple cookies. With every request, including when reloading the page, the browser will check if there are any cookies associated with the website and automatically add them to the request, this time using the cookie header. The server will receive the request, including any cookies it has previously set. Based on the value of the cookies received, the server will return this personalized page. I can also instruct my browser to delete this cookie, and if I hit the reload button once more, I will get the original message as the request included no cookie. I have included the link to this example in the video description so that you can play with it as well. I have used Glitch to write simple examples and the code is available if you are technically inclined. Cookies are also deployed when you try to log into a website. Instead of entering your username and password for every action you make, you have to do this only once. You essentially exchange your username and password for a unique identifier that a website will send in a cookie. This is the same concept as a cloakroom example given previously. When you close a website and later come back, you are still logged in. You are still logged in because you still have the cookie and your logging session was deemed valid. It did not take long for cookies to be supported in all browsers and their adoption was soon widespread. The initial idea of cookies has been mainly for functional reasons. This is why we often refer to these cookies as functional cookies. Without them, it is very hard or impossible to use some websites as you won't be able to log in or use other features. So cookies were born as a way to differentiate users and to show content relevant to each user. So far so good. But why did cookies become such a privacy issue? Advertisers wanted to offer more targeted ads to their users. It did not take long for the advertising industry to see the tracking potential that cookies have. Introducing third-party cookies. As the name implies, third-party cookies are cookies we receive from other websites without actually visiting them. And it is not one or two cookies. In a single visit to a website, you may be gathering hundreds of cookies from various websites. Well, technically speaking, we are visiting these websites, but in the background without us noticing anything. One of the most basic ways of getting third-party cookies is through a one-pixel image embedded in the page, also known as a tracking pixel. When a browser receives a response from a website, this often contains additional files like images or scripts which need to be downloaded separately. All these requests run in the background without you knowing about them. And some of these files being downloaded come from other websites. This is how you get third-party cookies. Let's take a look at a quick example of a tracking pixel. First, I will use the developer tools to delete the cookie from the tracking website. Now let's go to this news website and see what is going on. Apparently not much. Even if I hit reload, nothing is changing. But let's open the developer tools in the browser and take a look at the HTTP traffic. Notice that the news website was called first and right after this another HTTP request was made. This additional call has visited the tracking website without us noticing it. The tracking pixel is hidden in the HTML code of the news website. You can easily see it if you inspect the source code of the page and look for the image tag. This is sufficient to instruct the browser to call the tracking website in the background. Now we have a cookie from the tracking website that we did not want to visit. This is confirmed by opening the tracking website, which will be able to identify us as returning visitors, 
as we have the tracking cookie. This is how a very primitive tracking pixel works. A pixel is the smallest size an image can have. If you make it white, transparent or hide it completely, no user will notice it. Sometimes things can be hidden in plain sight. Anytime a website embeds a Facebook like button, a YouTube video, a tweet or an ad, these other websites are called in the background as well. While this may seem harmless, these other websites can set their own cookies and track your movements. This basic trick allowed advertisers to set cookies uniquely identifying a person. With this identifier, advertisers can track which websites and pages you visit, when, for how long and how often. Every click you make is tracked, sometimes by multiple ad networks at the same time. The advertising industry heavily relies on cookies to know which websites you visit and to build profiles. While they may not know your name and address, they will often know in which city or area you live, which are your interests. They can make educated guesses about your age and sex. Their goal is to deliver more targeted ads so that you buy more. The more they know about you, the better the ads. This is why when you sometimes read a blog post about a topic, you will later see ads on other websites recommending products. Your browser happily stores and sends back any cookies, helping advertisers identify you. Not only that, this tracking continues beyond your computer and it won't take long to see the same ads on your phone as well. But wait, it gets worse. For example, if you're already logged into Facebook, any visit you make to a website with a Facebook like button or similar could be directly associated with you. The more websites embed like and share buttons, the more Facebook and co know about you. And I use Facebook as an example, but the same idea applies to Google and other companies running ad networks. So to recap now, we have first party cookies from the website we intended to visit, most of them being for functional reasons like saving settings, login, or keeping items in a shopping cart, and third-party cookies, which come primarily from ad networks and other trackers. However, I must point out that there are still some legitimate reasons for using third-party cookies. Most of them are for very technical reasons and I won't get into that. The European Union wanted to give users more control over their privacy and has created the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR, which went into effect in 2018. Similar regulations started popping up in other regions as well. This was when these consent banners started appearing. If websites use cookies, they are obligated to inform their users about them. The idea is to have your explicit consent in terms of tracking and the use of cookies. But we all know that this does not work as intended since they are often designed to give you no choice of rejecting cookies and even if you wish to do so, you will need to spend minutes clicking on dozens of checkboxes or switches. Good idea, lousy implementation if you ask me. There are exceptions, but very, very few. Some browsers decided to take action against these tracking cookies. Firefox has limited the support for third-party cookies and many browsers, including Google Chrome, will stop supporting third-party cookies by the end of 2023. Cookies altogether are not dying and so far, there has not been a better way to solving some specific needs that web applications have. Blocking these third-party cookies is also not the end of tracking. There are many other ways to store data on the browser, including local storage, IndexedDB or WebSQL. Advertisers are already using other ways of tracking users without cookies. The more you use your computer and browser, the more personalization you bring to your surfing behavior. Your browser type and version, your browser extensions, 
the fonts you have installed on your computer, your screen resolution, and much more can be used to create a digital fingerprint of your online presence without involving any cookies at all. This is called browser fingerprinting. You can take a look at websites such as miunique.org and cover your tracks from the Electronic Frontier Foundation to test your browser fingerprint. I guess that you will be surprised. Finally, let's look at how you can get rid of these annoying cookie warnings and improve your privacy while using the internet. Let me begin by saying that blocking all cookies won't do much good as most websites cannot function without them. The browser I would recommend you look into is Brave. Brave is based on the open source project Chromium that Google Chrome uses. If you are already using Google Chrome, migrating to Brave will be pretty easy as the data import is straightforward and all Chrome extensions are compatible. What Brave does best is blocking trackers by default, limiting third-party cookies, informing you about what's being blocked, and trying to prevent browser fingerprinting as much as possible. Combine this protection with a Chrome extension I don't care about cookies and you may be on track to spending less time clicking boxes and protecting your privacy just a bit more. Good alternatives are also Firefox or Safari as they are known for paying more attention to this privacy aspect. You may want to stay away from Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge, at least for the moment. I hope this was useful and has helped you better understand what cookies are and how they work. If you want to support me to make more videos like this one, like and subscribe, maybe hit that thanks button. Don't forget to leave a comment in the section below and I will see you next time.